Nissan GTR changed the automotive industry 11 years ago when it was launched. It pushed the boundaries and challenged the status quo as to what a sports car should be able to do at an affordable price range. However, as time went on, competition evolved. But I'm not so sure if the GTR really did the same. In fact, at the time I'm filming this video, I still haven't come to a full conclusion as to whether or not it's evolved enough. Now, don't get me wrong, I love the GTR. It was one of my dream cars. I had a chance to own one and I would totally own another one in the future. But as great of a car as it was, is it still that great in 2020? And is it still the same value proposition compared to the competition, which has also evolved over time? Ultimately, the question that I want to answer is, is the GTR still awesome? And as always, if you enjoy the video, I would really appreciate it if you liked and subscribed because I plan on making content like this regularly. So really appreciate all the support. Now let's get into it. All right, boys and girls, in order to better understand where the GTR came from, we need to hop into the time machine and dial it back to good old 2009. And just to give you guys a little bit of a reminder of what that environment was like, Kanye West had a disagreement with Taylor Swift. We met a badass pilot. There was a little bit of a housing crisis and a little bit of an automotive industry crisis, which was later less of a crisis. And of course, Nissan introduced the GTR to the US market starting at around $70,000. And since we're in the time machine, we gotta think about what inflation really means. So just in today's dollars, just think of it as $84,500. Just that number will come in handy later. But if you think about it, $70,000, and this is what I meant when I said affordable earlier in the video, it's really the price of a fully loaded E-Class or 5 Series. And to get a car with 480 horsepower with a zero to 60 time of, let's be conservative and say three and a half seconds, with a top speed of 193 miles an hour, it's got exotic factor. I mean, this was unheard of. In fact, we've never seen another deal as good as what the GTR was in 2009. Well, there is one car that was recently launched that brought back some GTR type memories, but we know what was promised and we know what the market ended up showing us. So I think it's excluded. Not to say that the GTRs didn't have some level of markup, but some of these are just ridiculous on the C8 Corvette, I'm sorry. So like I said, from a performance perspective, the GTR absolutely blew everybody's mind in 2009. 480 horsepower, derived out of a 3.8 liter twin turbo V6, dual clutch automatic transmission, top speed of 193 miles an hour, zero to 60 in 3.5 seconds. And Nissan said that the GTR was untunable, but it didn't take long for folks to create a tune that gave the car upwards of another 100 horsepower. So you could say it was quite the stimulus package, <laughs> if you know what I mean. <laughs> uh... Jesus Christ. Okay, so what really lit people's pants on fire about the GTR is the infamous, the glorious, the record setting Nürburgring lap time of seven minutes and 29 seconds and I'm gonna play some of it for you right now. I don't know about you guys, but before I watched this video back in 2009, I mean, the only Nürburgring lap video that I had seen prior to that was when Sabine Smits on Top Gear did the van in I think 2005 in less than 10 minutes. But before then, I had no idea really the significance of the Nürburgring and this video is really what introduced me to what benchmarking on this racetrack was all about. And the fact that the GTR set a 7 minute 29 second lap time and someone contextualized that by saying that's the same time it takes a Porsche Carrera GT, that's $400,000 to do the same lap, that 
literally blew my mind. And as a result, I think these Nurburgring lap times started to get a lot more publicized and it was really a pretty interesting competition to see manufacturers go head to head. I remember watching the ZR1 do it. I remember the ACR video that did it where the driver literally pinged off of the rev limiter the whole time. I mean, the Nurburgring craze really for me started with the GTR. And of course, look at Nissan being modest about their legend. But they weren't wrong. With the R35, Nissan's GTR, the Godzilla, the legend, it really was reborn. And it was out making shockwaves throughout the automotive industry. I mean, let's just take a second to talk about the reviews. There were a million different news outlets that were just raving about this car, completely giving it the best praise that they've given any vehicle. Just look for yourself. One of them even said, if it didn't cost $70,000 and have a Nissan badge, it would be one of the most exotic cars in the world based off of its performance. So not only was the customer reception pretty good, but all of the media, all of the reviewers, magazines, they all had positive things to say about it. And I know what you're thinking, Velocity Crew, we're about seven minutes into this video and you've done nothing but stroke the GTR's ego. You didn't criticize it once. What are you, a fanboy or something? Well, the truth is, we're still in the time machine and we're in 2009. We just came back to see what was the world like when the GTR came out? What did people have to say about it? They talked about its practicality, its performance, its extreme disruption of the market. A lot of people didn't really criticize it too much. Sure, they made fun of the design and they said it sounded like a vacuum cleaner. And the one that really cracked me up was when they would say, it drives like it's a PlayStation video game. So I think this has a lot to do with the fact that the GTR was heavily reliant on its computer systems to ensure that the all wheel drive, the traction control, the suspension, the engine, everything was working in unison to ensure optimal performance. But the cherry on top that solidified the GTR as the video game car was that Nissan contracted Polyphony Digital, yep, the same people who made Gran Turismo, the racing simulator, to create their multimeter user interface for the center console. So now that you know where the GTR came from, let's go back to present day and see how it evolved and where it is now. It's been 11 years, I'm sure a lot's changed. Whoa, okay, I can see elements of the R35. Yeah, that's, I mean, it might take a little getting used to, but it's definitely an evolution of the car. Okay, 2020, I see, Nissan, you've brought the R35 quite a lot. Oh, okay, well, then what does the actual 2020 look like? Oh. All right, well, I mean, I guess not everything is based on looks and we can't judge a car based off of the exterior design over the years. We should take a look at how it's evolved in other ways. All right, all right, I'm just trolling. I mean, the fact of the matter is the car hasn't changed a whole lot. I mean, that's the whole reason why I'm making this video is because it's really just been small and incremental changes over the past 11 years. In fact, the thing that's probably changed about this car the most is the price. I mean, let's just do a quick little trip down memory lane, right? Remember I told you the car started in 2009 at about $70,000. Well, according to an article by Motor Trend, it said that Nissan was announcing an interim price hike, which is unusual for any automaker to do before the next production year, of an average of about $7,000, which is almost a 10% price increase. And they cited new market conditions and that the GTR was priced uh, a year prior where maybe materials and labor costs were not as high. So, the fact that in the first year the GTR already went up 10% in price after it already been announced indicates that Nissan probably realized they made a little bit of an oopsie. 
So any orders received before September 5th, 2008, were able to get the $70,000 price range. Anything after was at about $77,000 on average. So uh, if you weren't an early adopter, you still got a good deal, but outside of any dealer markups, you were pretty much starting off at around $77,000. So just out of pure curiosity, I wanted to see what the variation of all the GTR MSRPs were across all the different trim levels in the past 11 years. So I created a nifty little chart and that means we're going back to school. Yeah, that was corny. Okay, boys and girls, welcome to Velocity Crew University where you will learn absolutely nothing important. And today's topic is GTR pricing strategy over the past 11 years. For now, we'll just focus on new car prices because used car prices is a whole different story, but definitely feel free to pause the video and take a look at this in more depth if you're into this type of stuff. And also leave a comment below if you like this level of detail, because I'm just trying out new things and I like data. So the first thing that sticks out to me here is the base MSRP of the 2009 car versus the base MSRP of the 2020 car. There is a $43,000 difference. And why is this important? Well, I personally like to know where's the value proposition? If you remember in the beginning of the video, we talked about inflation, how a $70,000 car in 2009 is like spending $85,000 today. Well, if we keep that in mind and consider that the GTR today is an entry price of 113,000, that's $29,000 more. So is it $29,000 more of a car than it was back in 09? I guess we're gonna figure that out, but take a look at the base price increases of the GTR as it progressed through its various generations. So gen one, which was a four year long period was about a $14,000 increase. Gen two, was about 15 and a half. Gen 3, which was really just a minor facelift, was only 2,000. But going back into Gen 4, it went up another 12,000 throughout that period. And of course, this has to do with a lot of different things, but we're just talking base price. So the question is, again, did the changes warrant this price increase? Well, we still need to figure that out. And this one just cracks me up. So model price gap is essentially the difference in dollar value between the lowest cost trim level and the highest cost trim level in a given year. If you take a look at 2020 with the $210,000 Nismo GTR, it is $97,000 more than the GTR premium, which is the base model of that year. Now, granted, it does come standard with $15,000 carbon ceramic brakes and it has design elements from the Nismo GT3 race car, but still, that's almost a hundred grand. So would you rather have something else with that hundred grand? That's up to you because this car is clearly designed for the ultimate GTR enthusiast and people will pay it. Although there are still plenty sitting on dealership floors and one of them is already being discounted, $35,000. And that concludes the Velocity Crew University video in a video. Like I said, if you guys don't mind, just leave me a comment below and let me know if you like this concept because I don't mind data deep dives, but I know it's not everybody's cup of tea. So with that, let's get back to figuring out, is the GTR still awesome? I have been harping on the terminology value proposition throughout this whole video. And value proposition is a difficult one because value means different things to different people. It doesn't matter how much the GTR costs, it doesn't matter what its performance is like, some people, just because they love the GTR, will pay whatever Nissan is asking. And that's completely fine, because you can't really put a logical explanation to value being driven purely off an emotional attachment. However, if we take a more practical approach, value, tells me, well, what is the car physically giving me for the money that I pay? And how does it stack up to other offerings in the marketplace relative to its cost? 
So in other words, what's my value for money here? Meaning, what do I really get out of the car? And am I missing out by not going another route? I know that sounds a little theoretical, but it's an important factor when answering the question, is the GTR still awesome? And the good news is, is on paper, the specs of the car are still world class. Zero to 60 in less than three seconds, almost 200 mile an hour car, extreme performance, there's no question about that. However, depending on what your interests are, there's a number of different cars these days that offer same levels of performance for a similar price, but they offer a lot more refinement and a lot more enhancements that have come to the model in general. So think back to that first year GTR. Remember I said that it was around the going price of a loaded E-Class or a 5 Series? Well, the current price of the GTR puts it well within the category of an E63S or a BMW M5 competition, both of which offer similar if not better levels of performance and they offer extreme refinement and luxury. So again, depending on what you're into, the value proposition may or may not be there. And while we're on the topic of competitors, it would be an absolute sin for me to not mention the 911 Turbo. You see, when these two cars were first pitted against one another, the GTR had similar levels, if not better levels of performance. And from a price point, the 911 Turbo was almost twice as much as the GTR. And uh, boys and girls, this is where it becomes an uphill battle for the GTR because quite honestly in 2020, it's not even a comparison anymore. Yeah, whether or not you have the details on Porsche's new 992 Turbo and Turbo S, let me just tell you that it's really an unfair comparison pitting it up against the GTR in 2020. It's just a completely new legal car. I mean, Motor Trend tested the Turbo S at zero to 60 of 2.3 seconds. And some sources are even saying that this thing may be capable of doing a sub seven minute Nürburgring lap time. Again, just to contextualize that, the 918 Spider did it in six minutes and 57 seconds. So let that sink in. So where does that leave us? We talked about where the GTR came from. I mean, we took a time machine back to 2009 to see what the world environment was like and why the GTR made headlines and absolutely shattered records and changed the industry. We talked about how the prices evolved over time and what the current landscape of the competitors of the GTR looks like and how it really hasn't evolved as much as a lot of the competition. But one thing that we haven't really talked about, and this is a really big part in answering the question of whether or not a car is awesome, is the community. And in my opinion, the GTR community is probably one of the best in the automotive world. I mean, even if you're an owner or an enthusiast that just loves the car, there are so many different groups that you can join on social media or different forums that make you feel included and it's just very informational. I mean, in the one year that I owned my car, I joined a couple groups and I still elect to stay notified of posts and updates just because it's cool to see how people constantly are updating and evolving their cars. I mean, anything that the GTR ever lacked in physical evolution over the years, the community, especially the tuning culture and the potential that these cars now have, it more than makes up for it. I mean, this is a truly unique car from a pure community perspective. So, the GTR, is it still awesome? Well, that seemed like a pretty innocent and simple question to ask at first, but after really diving into the history of the car and reflecting on some of my ownership experience and thinking about the community and all the other cars and all the factors and prices and everything out there, I've come to an answer. 
And that is quite simply, yes. And if we're talking brand new, even though it's not the value proposition that it once was, in the pre-owned market, the GTR really excels because they've retained a lot of their values. And right now, the 2015 and 2016 cars are at a really good sweet spot where you can pick them up for a good deal, you still have a relatively new car, and you can easily ingrain yourself into the community. And again, I can't stress how helpful and how engaging the community of the GTR is. If you just go to any one of those groups that I listed before, and you post, hey guys, I just got a GTR, this is my first one, I'm new to the community, what can you tell me? Immediately people will reach out to help, they'll welcome you in, and you'll feel like you're a part of something bigger. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that brings today's video to a close. And for the three of you that are probably still watching, I really appreciate you uh, making it this far, and hopefully you at least learned something or otherwise just enjoyed the content. And it really means a lot that uh, you're watching the video. So uh, please feel free to leave a comment below if you have any questions or if you have any other topics that you want me to cover in the automotive world uh, because I just have a bunch of random knowledge and I like researching this stuff. And uh, just in general, just thank you so much for watching the videos and uh, just supporting. Like the last C63 video I did, it's got over a thousand views as of today and I got like 15 new subscribers from it. So to me, that's pretty wild. So anyway, just wanted to say thanks. I'm rambling now and uh, you guys are awesome. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.